two tornadoes touched down near downtown Nashville. 2020. International public health emergency. As a church body and community, we had so much to face. We, like most other churches in the area, have decided to go digital. To grieve and to overcome. The urgent investigation into a Christmas morning explosion. It wasn't easy and we had to respond creatively. We had to rethink the ways we did church. Community still happened. We witnessed the faithfulness of God at work through the faithfulness of His people here at home. And the gospel of Jesus Christ was still proclaimed. Help was given in a time when it was so desperately needed. We made adjustments. We served with our time, our treasures, and our talents. We answered the challenge that was put before us, and the gospel of Jesus Christ was demonstrated. Despite everything we were up against, God's glory was revealed in the work of His people. We were able to see and celebrate God at work throughout Middle Tennessee and around the world because we engaged the whole person with the whole gospel of Jesus Christ anywhere, anytime, with anybody. In 2021, we will continue to have gospel conversations, build disciple-making relationships, and create healthy congregations. We may not know everything future holds, but we know the one who holds the future. Well, good morning. Welcome to the church at West Franklin. I'm glad you're here, whether you're here in the room with us or whether you're joining us online. I want to say a special welcome to you. As you just saw in that video, the annual report is out, and uh, basically it's just a testimony to God's goodness and faithfulness in the midst of a very difficult year. Uh, if you can read all you want about 2020 and uh, the way God worked in various campuses and throughout all of Brentwood uh, on your bulletin that hopefully came to your phone this morning, uh, if you're new and wondering how do you get that info, I would just text the word e-bulletin to 623-623, and you can get the bulletin sent right to your phone. And later, not during the service, but after the service, you can read all you want to about the annual report. One of the reasons, or outside the Holy Spirit, the reason we're able to continue to do ministry like you'll read about, like you just saw about, is because of your continued faithfulness in giving and generosity. We're able to be creative in ministries, be creative in taking the kingdom or the, advancing the gospel, chasing away darkness with the gospel light because of your continued giving and faithful in that and generosity. So thank you, and please continue to do so so we can see what God wants to do next and be open to what he wants to do next in this year, 2021. Well, Brad is on sabbatical, and um, I almost followed up by saying, so, so we're in for a really tr good treat, but <laughs> that would have sounded worse than I'm in for it, too. We are in for a treat, but it's not because, yeah, it's not because Brad is out, necessarily. But because Brad is out, we have some guests that will be filling in for the next several weeks. The guy behind me's name is Don Moen. You may or may not have heard of him, uh, but I can almost guarantee if you've grown up in church like I have, you have sung and been ministered to by one or more of his songs. I was in high school, and believe it or not, yours truly was in the youth choir in high school. Stud. And I grew up hearing all the Bible stories. I knew God could do amazing things. But it wasn't until high school that I sung a particular song that it those truths begin to have heart to them. I realized that singing truth is incredibly important. And that song was God Will Make a Way When There Seems to Be No Way, written by Don Moen. Didn't know it all at the time, who, who it was. But that song had a tremendous impact on how I was led to worship God. So I'm thrilled and honored to have Don Moen here. So why don't we give him a good West Franklin welcome and prayerfully be in tune. It's good to be with you today. And uh, so the connection uh, 
Brad, uh, my, my, one of my sons married Brad's sister. So um, uh, my, my uh, son and Sarah, uh, Brad's little sister, went to an eighth grade prom and they came to our house. We lived in Mobile, Alabama then. And, uh, and when they, I saw them together, I said to Laura, my wife, I said, that girl's going to be my daughter-in-law. And eight years later, she was. So now they have four kids, and uh, that's Laura would be here with me today, except uh, uh, they had a wedding, where, in fact, where Brad is at a wedding in Georgia, and we had told them that we would watch the kids. And they hadn't decided they're going to take the newborn with them yet. And Anyway, uh, so they went, and Laura and I watched the kids. <laughs> so... so it's the first time she'd left a little baby, so I was like, if my eyes are drooping a little bit. Uh, we have five kids. We raised five children, and I just remember shuffling through the house a lot, and, uh, and it all came to back, back to me last night. <laughs> you know, 11.30 at night, uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, and uh, finally at about 5.30, I said to Laura, I'm going home and taking a shower, and uh, i got to get down here to sing. <laughs> Otherwise, she'd be here with me. Um, all right. As we gather in this place today, Holy Spirit, come and have your way, have your way. As we lay aside our own desires, sweep across our hearts with holy fire and have your this is your house and it's your home we welcome you lord we welcome you this is your house and it's your home we welcome you today yes we do we welcome you today Lord, we welcome you. Come and do all that you want to do in our hearts today and in this place. This is your house. This is your home. So come. In Jesus' name. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of the Lord has done for us. And now, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. To stand and sing, give thanks with a grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One, give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son, give thanks with a grateful heart, give thanks. He's given Jesus Christ His Son And now let the weak say I am strong Let the poor say I am rich Because of what the Lord has done Because of what the Lord has 
something that I want to say. Say it with me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all you've given to me, for all the blessings that I cannot see. Say it. grateful heart, with a song of praise, with an outstretched arm, I will bless your name and thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank darkness and gave me your light. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You took my sin and my shame. Yes, you did. You took my sickness and healed all my pain. With a grateful heart, with a song of praise, with an outstretched arm, I will bless your name and thank you, Lord. Well, I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, I just want to thank you, Lord. Yes, we do. Thank you, Lord. Well, I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank We thank you this morning for all you've done in our lives. And by faith, we say thank you for what you're about to do. In the name of Jesus. And Lord, I offer my life to you. Everything I've been through. We've been through a lot, eh? Use it for your glory. Lord, I offer my days to you, lifting my praise to you as a pleasing sacrifice. Lord, I offer you my life. Things in the Things yet unseen, wishes and dreams that are yet to come true. Oh, all of my hopes and all of my plans, my heart and my hands are lifted to you. Sing it. Lord, I offer my life to you. Everything I Use it for your glory. And Lord, I offer my days to you, lifting my praise to you as a pleasing sacrifice. Lord, I offer you my life. Lord, I offer you
God is able to do uh, exceedingly abundantly above all that we ever ask or think. And all that we've been through in 2020, somehow God is going to use it for our good and for his glory. Amen. We serve a great God. How great is our God. Sing it. Oh, sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great. How great is our God. Yes, he is. Lift your voice, sing it. Oh, how great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God name above all names oh he's the name above all names yes worthy of our praise my heart will say how great is our God name above all names oh he's the name above worthy, worthy of our praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. Oh, lift it up, how great, oh, how great is our God. Oh, sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, yeah. how great is our God. How great, oh, how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Yes, He is. He's a great God. Let's give Him praise this morning. Amen. You can be seated. You know, we serve a great God. And uh, Lord, forgive us for making you too small. Come and be big in our lives, in this church, in our homes, in our city. In Jesus' name. You know, my pastor uh, said to me, um, this whole pandemic started about a year ago, <clears throat> Don, I want you to believe with me that God's going to take us from survival to revival. And, uh, and I said, I'm with you on that. Now, there was the first few months of this thing, Pastor, I was kind of saying, well, I'll sure be glad when we get back to normal. And now I'm not so sure about that because God has more for us. Something fresh, something new. And it starts by having hearts that are hungry. Are you ready for something new? The song says, a hungry heart is what I bring to the table of my king. Wash me in your presence, 
refresh my life again. A hungry heart is what I bring to the table of my King. For there my soul is satisfied With all the goodness He provides All that I need is there by faith The table is set with mercy and grace So I come with a hungry heart As I come into His presence Well, I am made complete Feasting at His table And sitting at His feet Then I will run and not grow weary I will walk and never I will rise on wings like eagles For the Lord will be my strength A hungry heart is what I bring To the table of my King For there my soul is satisfied with all the goodness He provides All that I need is there by faith The table is set with mercy and grace So I come with a hungry heart Just as I am without one plea But that thy blood was shed for me And as you bid me come to thee O Lamb of God, I come A hungry heart is what I bring to the table of my King For there my soul is satisfied With all the goodness He provides All that I need is there by faith The table is set with mercy and grace So I come with a hungry heart So I come With a hungry heart Oh yes I do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For you to do something new in our lives. In Jesus' name. And God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to with love and strength for each new day He will make a way He will make a way Just sing it with me God will make a way Oh God will make a way Yes He will Where there seems to be no way He works in ways we cannot see will make a way for me. He will be my guide. 
hold me closely to his side with love and strength for each new day he will make a way he will make a way by a roadway in the wilderness he'll lead me rivers in the desert will I see Heaven and earth will fade, but his word will still remain. That's right, and he will do something new today. Oh, God will make a way, yes, he will, where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. Will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day. He will make a way. He will make a way. With love and strength. With love and strength for each new day. He will make a way, He will make a way, yes He will, He will make a way for you, my friend, amen. If you have your Bibles, take your copy and turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Don, thank you for leading us. That was decent, I guess. It'll do. <laughs> it, was, it was fantastic. Thank you. My soul needed that, and I'm sure our congregation agrees with me on that. So thank you for leading us. Luke 15. We are slowly going through the Gospel of Luke, taking some mini series within the, the, the series of Luke's Gospel. All this month we've been looking at the parables, or some of the parables from, that Luke chose to record, and uh, this is the last of the ones we'll look at, and we'll pick up with a new mini-series within Luke next week. I believe it's called The Cost, is the next series that we'll be looking at in Luke's gospel, but we cannot close a series on the parables without looking at this one, the parable known as the parable of the prodigal son. So hopefully you found Luke 15, I'm going to invite you to stand with me and as we remind ourselves that this is God's word, these words were spoken by Jesus himself. And mercy, goodness, what a parable this is. Luke 15, beginning with verse 11. <clears throat> he, Jesus, also said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered 
his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food and here I am dying of hunger? I'll get up, go to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter and let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. As he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Well, then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, Look, I have been slaving many years for you, and I have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Son, he said to him, You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice. Because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Jesus, you know what the people in this room and those online need to hear from this parable. So give me some words the next few minutes. But may we take the richness of this parable with us and may its implications land on us day in and day out. May we be a church who longs to bring you joy. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. In three weeks, March the 20th, my parents will celebrate 50 years of marital bliss. And yours truly and his, his two sisters are in the middle of planning their blessed shindig. It is a surprise, so I'm not going to say too much because mom may stumble across this sermon somewhere on the internet webs. But due to COVID, we're having to be limited in our, on our guest list. The guest list is being limited to my parents, of course, my two sisters, myself, our spouses, and our children, which in and of itself, that, just that is 23 people. So if I pass the plate two or three extra times, you know why. Just kidding. So we are planning it and having a good time. But even if there were no COVID restrictions, there'd be certain people we would not invite. For instance, my younger sister's first husband would not be on the guest list. Not that he's not a decent guy. I mean, I've got a couple thoughts, but not because he's not a decent guy. But because if he was there, it'd be a little bit awkward for my parents, for my sister, for my sister's husband now. <laughs> And if everybody walked in, what is he doing here? Who invited him? 
And the person who did the inviting would look foolish for inviting such a person to such a party. I also, my dad was engaged to a woman before he met my mom. My mom calls her Tilly Tootin. I do not know what her name is, but my mom calls her Tilly Tootin. I did not reach out to Tilly Tootin and invite her to this blessed event so that she could celebrate 50 years of her first fiance. That'd be weird. If she were there, I could imagine people walking in and saying, who invited her? What is she doing here? And the person who invited her would look foolish. There's a story in 2 Samuel 9. I encourage you to read it later, not now. There's a fascinating story where King David invites his enemy's grandson to a feast. If you read closely, you see that because of a promise David made to his enemy's son, he not only invites his enemy's grandson to a feast, but gives him a permanent seat at the table. I can imagine as people were beginning to gather that first night with the enemy's grandson sitting at the table, the the whispers, the hubbub around was, who invited him? What is he doing here? And I can just see the cook saying, ask the king, he did it. King David looked foolish for inviting him. Can you imagine the first night when young boy was back home? (laughs) Everybody was going to be there. Filet was on the menu. Who would miss that? I thought for sure this Baptist church would get some amens out of that. (laughs) Yeah, wake up. Everybody was going to be there. But can you imagine him at the table next to dad's seat? Who invited him? (laughs) What is he doing here? Last I heard, he lost everything and lying in some pig slop. Now, is, is that daddy's special robe? He treated dad as if he was dead. I mean, that's what you do when you want your inheritance early. You pretty much tell your parents, I wish you were dead. He treated his dad as if he was dead, took all his money and left. And now he's back and he's he's, he's, he's showered, obviously. He's gotten a shave. And he's wearing dad's special robe. He's, he's He's got dad's ring on his finger. He's got new shoes. And we're having filet. What? is he doing here? Who invited him? I don't know, honey. Ask your daddy. He's the one that wanted him here. Guess who looks foolish in the story? Daddy. Why would you give him a seat at the table? This story is partly correctly been, I didn't say that right, but has been correctly, to an extent, titled the parable of the prodigal son. It's true. There's a story of a son who went crazy. So that's partly true. But it's also been titled the parable of the two sons, or you could argue a parable of the two prodigal sons, because there's two prodigals in the story. I hope you saw that. One is prodigal in his actions, the other was prodigal in his attitude. Church people can be just as lost in our attitude than we can with our wild and crazy living. But I wonder if by labeling it a parable of sons, we miss the point. What if it's not about the sons at all? What if author and pastor Tim Keller, who wrote a book on this entire parable, and he called it Prodigal God, I wonder if he's not right. What if this story is about a God who's prodigal? You know what the word prodigal means? Recklessly extravagant. Having spent everything. That's what the word means, recklessly extravagant. When you read the parable, who's recklessly extravagant? Daddy. 
Recently, some folks, some friends of ours that Katie and I have known for a while invited us out to eat. It's funny, when I lived in Arkansas, nobody came to Arkansas to take us out to eat. But now that I'm in Franklin, people come to Franklin all the time. And they say, hey, we're going to Jay Alexander's, we're treating. I said, I don't care if you're friends or not. Jay Alexander's, you're treating, we'll go. I don't know who you are, but we'll be there. Now, we knew them, they're friends. And you have to know the guy. It was just us four, Katie and I and, and the other couple. You have to know the guy, but he, he was really extravagant with ordering. If you know anything about Jay Alexander's, they give you monstrous um, portions. Like, yes. And we sit down, we order our drinks, waters. We sit down and we order our drinks, and, and the waitress comes and says, uh, would you like an appetizer? And before Katie, Katie and I really didn't want, because we know the portions, are, yeah, we'll take this, this, this. He orders three for the table of four people. He orders three appetizers. I'm like, oh, my gosh, we're not, never going to be. And then as I'm reading the menu, I'm, I said, oh, I don't know if you've tried this barbecue chicken pizza before, but it's fantastic. Waitress walks by, hey, we want one of those barbecue chicken pizza. I said, no, no, that's not what I want for my meal. I don't care. We want one for the table. So before you know it, we've got three or four appetizers coming to the table, huge portions before we've even ordered our meal. We order our meal. We're sick as we can possibly be, got more food ready to take home than we've eaten. And then the waitress says, would anybody like dessert? You don't go to Jay Alexander's without carrot cake. And even though we are full, he goes, who wants dessert? We, we're like, woo, woo, woo. and he goes, we'll take a carrot cakes for the table. I'm like, oh my God, coffee, carrot cake. And he's just ordering and ordering and ordering and ordering and we're stuffing it in. We take home way more than we even think about eating. It was recklessly extravagant. I don't know what the bill was, but it had to have been just shy of a car payment. It was Incredible. The guy was a freak with ordering, and that's what I think of here, recklessly extravagant, going overboard before you can open your mouth, just saying, look, it's yours. Who invited him? What is he doing here? Ask your dad. One of the sons got to enjoy the celebration. One of the sons got to have filet mignon roll around his taste buds. The other son stayed outside. The other son couldn't stand it. Oh, he was mad. You see, Jesus tells this parable to church people. Jesus tells this parable who are threatened by that kind of grace. Jesus tells this parable to people that think that's scandalous. The parable is really for the older son crowd. Look how Luke starts it. Go back to verse 1 of Luke chapter 15. Look how he sets the context for this parable. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. That's Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes were complaining, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. You get it? Here's the context. Jesus is having a party with tax collectors and sinners, the riffraff of society, the people that go to the bars, the people that cheat people out of money, the people that we tell our kids to stay away from. Jesus calls himself the son of God. Jesus calls himself God himself. And he is sitting there welcoming, eating, having a good time with tax collectors and sinners. And the church people are like, he is being a prodigal with his time. He is being way too wasteful with his attention and with his time. And so Jesus tells three parables. And it all leads to the last little bit of the older son looking in and hearing music. Why does Jesus tell the parable? to help those church people understand what God really looks like and to give them a mirror of their own heart. I wonder if we've gotten it all wrong. 
I wonder if we church folks have got it all wrong and we might actually think that what brings God joy is our efforts for him. But if I'm understanding this parable correctly, what brings the heart of God joy isn't what we do for him, but expressing our need for him. What brings God joy is when he gets to dote over us. Could it be that we have messed it up and we think God's so proud of us for being here on Sunday morning when really he's just there waiting to shower us with his love and grace and mercy the moment we express our need? Look, look, look what happens. Look what, look what Jesus does. Right after he just gets the glimpse of, 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 of the religious people, the Pharisees and the scribes complaining that he, he welcomes sinners and eats with them. They're like, how, how could somebody that associates with God could actually do this with someone? He tells these parables. Look in verse 3. You know this parable, but let's look at it. See, see the point he's trying to make. Verse 3. He, so he told them this parable. What man among you, verse 4, who, who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? When he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together saying to them, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. Watch this, verse 7. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. What's Jesus saying? Here's what brings me joy when a sinner sees their need for me and I get to be reckless and extravagant with my grace. That's what brings him joy. Not 99 people who don't think they need help. And just in case we miss the point, he gives another one. Sometimes Jesus knows we need some extra. Maybe not you, but the person you're sitting next to. He continues, verse 8, or what woman has 10 silver coins? If she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me because I found the silver coin I lost. I tell you, here we go again. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. Church at West Franklin, you're smart people. What brings God joy when a lot of people are strutting their stuff saying, look at what we're doing for you, or when sinners cry out to Jesus saying, save me? And then Jesus tells this third parable. It's fascinating. Who invited him? I love it. He goes home and he started his speech, right? You ever gotten in trouble with mom and dad and you had a speech already? I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but he didn't get it all out. Poor daddy said, shh. My mom told me I couldn't say shut up, so I'm not going to say he said shut up. But he was like, shh. Fire up the grill. We having some meat tonight. Go get the robe. Get this man showered and shaved. Let's get some fresh shoes on him. Let's get, let's get the ring. Let's put it on him. Bring out the wine. If this is Baptist, bring out the near beer. Oh, if it's near, oh, Baptist don't even want anything to do. We don't want to be above reproach. Bring out the Dr. Pepper. We're having a party. Fire up Pitbull. Never mind, this is Baptist. Fire up Toby Mac. We are going to celebrate tonight. There's a party. And then about the third verse of Miami Sound Machine, the brother hears it. What's going on?
church. Daddy goes out to get him. Pleads with him. We don't know what he does. But where's dad? Partying with the sinners. Where's the father? He's not on the outside looking in with the religious folks thinking they know what's best. He's inside partying so he can show off how extravagant he is with those who don't deserve it. Here's a question. Where do you spend most of your time? With God? Or are you on the outside looking in? What's it going to take for us to be a church that constantly exists to bring God joy as opposed to a church that hopes he sees our efforts? What's it going to be a For us to become a church that joins in the celebration of heaven and joins in what God is doing by inviting and showing lost sinners how extravagantly loving and gracious God is. If I'm understanding this parable correctly, what causes heaven to celebrate is not you and I telling God how many Bible studies we're in. but us inviting people to the feast and letting God dote over them. Perhaps we're not busy doing this church because we don't know this father ourselves. Because we like being on the outside. What about you? I don't know about you, but I'm ready to be a church where people walk in and other people are like, who invited them? And it makes God look prodigal. You want to talk about prodigal? Giving your own son to have a relationship with you. That'll mess you up. In a good way. You know what I love? I love so much about it. How many times have I said, you know what I love about this parable? be grateful that there's a second service because the second service may not get out because I may preach until three or four. Just kidding, Don. I want you to get home to your grandkids. He doesn't let the son finish the speech. Why? He wasn't consumed with where he'd been and what he'd done. He had his boy back. He wanted to be with him. Church, Christianity screams, God wants you. And God went all prodigal to get you. And he did everything necessary by sending his son Jesus so that you could be with God. So I'm going to ask Don to come back up and he's going to close us with a chorus or a verse or two. But can I ask you to respond? whether you're at home watching online or whether you're in the room, this altar is open. You may want to pray where you are, but I want you to ask yourself two two, two questions. One, has God put someone in your life right now that just seems like if they were literally to turn to Jesus, people would say, who invited them? Has God put somebody in your life like that? It's not by accident. God wants to go all prodigal on them. 
just like he has on you. So if, ask God to help you show that person the nature of who God is. Now, second question is, do you enjoy God like this? Do you believe God enjoys you like this? Because if the answer is no, Christianity will never make true sense. You may be walking through the motions, but you're on the outside looking in. You're not celebrating. You're not feasting. Christianity is joy-filled because we're with the Father who loves us. Do you know this, God? Come to this altar and pray if you need it. Find one of us ministers. Email us. But as, he, as, as Don leads us in, a, song, uh, in a, a verse or a chorus or two, would you please respond and be obedient to what the Spirit's calling you to do? Jesus, thank you. Amen. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to His side. With love and strength for each new day. He will make a way. He will make a way. Sing it with me. God will. Oh, God will make a way. Where there seems to be no way He works in ways we cannot see He will make a way for me He will be my guide Hold me closely to His side With love and strength for each new day He will make a way will make a way with love and strength with love and strength for each new day he will make a way he will make a way oh yes he will he will make a way today. Thank you that you're making a way where there seems to be no way, a roadway in the wilderness and a river in the desert for each one here. In Jesus' name, go in the hope that God is working in ways that you cannot see today. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor.